welcome to the Millset World Virtual Summit 2021. We are very excited. This event has almost come to the end. Of course, we have the cherry on top before the closing ceremony because we have a fantastic conference today from NASA. We are super excited. We have enjoyed a lot uh, together with you, with all Millset members, with leaders from worldwide organizations who have joined the event. We have learned a lot of you today. We have a, a short round table, a small meeting gathering with, with uh, international organizations to learn a little bit more about them. We really want you to join the, the movement, the organization, and of course, we will be very pleased to know your comments. If you enjoyed it, I'm sure yes. Uh, well, um, as I'm telling you, this is almost the end of the event. I would like uh, to give uh, many greetings and to uh, say how proud I am from Milse team because uh, they, we all together have made a, a fantastic event, a lot of effort to, to bring to you these activities. Thank you to the Milset Executive Committee, uh, to the Milset Regional Executive Committees, to Movimiento STEM, also to UPEP University for supporting us, for hosting us here in, in our house, in Millset House. Thank you to all our sponsors and of course volunteers. We have a lot of volunteers. You may not see them, but we have a lot of people here on the stage, back the stage, uh, recording everything, Millset staff too. So we are very excited and um, we, we want to thank everybody for all these uh, opportunity to, to be together to make this uh, great event. Uh, we wish and we, we hope you have enjoyed it as much as we have since the first beginning. So uh, I am going to uh, give the floor to Bere Suarez. She's Millset Managing Director who will present our fantastic speaker. Bere, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Liz. And yeah, as you know, uh, and as you said, we are so happy uh, to have been working so hard and that uh, all the people that are joining us in this activity that is the summit uh, is, is happy and is participative uh, actively with all these activities. So today we are closing very, very hard with an, a high level speaker. Her name is Miss Kelly Martin Rivers. Ms. Martin Rivers joined a Stennis Space Center Office of Education in the spring of 2016 as the STEM Activities Program Manager leading implementation of the National Astro Camp Program, National Murip Minority Education Institute, and K-12 STEM engagement across Mississippi and Louisiana, responding to NASA's agency goals to improve STEM instruction by preparing new K-12 STEM teachers, supporting the existing STEM teachers workforce in NASA unique educational resources. But also to increase and sustain youth and public engagement in STEM. Mrs. Martin Rivers was named Director of Education for Stennis Space Center in December 2017, prior to joining NASA. She serves as a Chief of Intra Instructional Design for the Department of Defense Education Agency and, do, and the Marine Corps University College of Distance Education and Training. For seven years, working with the Department of Defense Schoolhouses across the Marine Corps and Air Force leading teams de developing custom online content and interactive instruction for both agency. Following graduation from the Ohio State University, Mrs. Martin Rivers started her career as a classroom teacher from 11 years in the Northern Virginia. After graduate work at George Mason University in special education technologies and the University of Virginia in project management. She has continually focused on her work in distant working for K-12 and adult professional learning in private industry and federal government. Mrs. Martin Rivers has been an educator for adults and K-12 students 
for 34 years. So today we are uh, receiving with all our deepest uh, congratulations and our deepest uh, emotion. We, I'm shaking <laughs> because it's really, really uh, important to have you here. Uh, our speaker, Mrs. Kelly Martin Rivers, that is the deputy director of NASA's Southeast Regional Office of STEAM Engagement. Mrs. Kelly, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here, to be asked uh, to present to you all at the Millset Virtual uh, World Virtual Summit. Um, education is my passion. Um, I never thought I would be a teacher. I come from a family of teachers and I took a year off after my first uh, a bachelor degree to teach for a year and apply to graduate school. And I never left the classroom or the love of teaching. So, you know, when when you know what you want to do, you uh, you follow it. Uh, and I followed it in a lot of different directions. But um, I'm at home at NASA and I'm happy to be with you today. Thank you for having me. And I'm very, very excited to share with you uh, and the Millset family uh, what NASA has to offer to international communities and international organizations in resources and in programs and opportunities for students, educators, uh, and uh, partners, NGO partners. So uh, let's get started, shall we? Share my screen. So uh, the Millset World Summit, I've been watching uh, the recorded presentations that you've had so far. And um, what I like about education and educators is that we always learn a lot from each other. And what I what I love about my job is that we never stop learning. Uh, and that's one of the beauties of working at NASA. So thank you for having me at the uh, Millset World Virtual Summit today. I am the Deputy Director of the Southeast Regional Office of STEM Engagement. As you can see from the slide, there are, a, there are uh, 10 different um, NASA centers around the country, uh, around the US, uh, and then there are some other um, uh, facilities that are connected with some of the centers. And where I live and where I work primarily is at NASA Stennis Space Center, which is on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. Uh, and it lies directly between Mishu Assembly Facility in New Orleans, and Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And this is a unique corridor for NASA. So every center at NASA uh, does something a little bit different to all to be a part of all that comes together uh, to create what NASA um, envisions and, um, and achieves in science uh, and exploration and uh, human exploration, uh, planetary you know, all, all across the board. Every center has its own unique um, space. Down here in the Gulf Coast at Stennis Space Center, we test rocket engines primarily. Uh, that is our primary focus. Uh, those engines <clears throat> are assembled at Mishu Assembly uh, Facility in New Orleans. Uh, they, <coughs> excuse me, they slide through a canal and come up a canal system through the uh, Gulf of Mexico into Stennis where they are tested on one of our, uh, in one of our multiple test stands that we have there. Um, they are designed uh, at Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, a lot of the design happens there. A lot of the, the technology of propulsion happens there as well. And then after um, this family here in the Gulf Coast region of, um, of uh, uh, rocket science um, happens, it's the the uh, engines are placed upon a barge and they swing around around Florida and come into Kennedy Space Center where they are uh, assembled onto the the rockets. I'm sorry, onto this um, the the space engines um, and then uh, ready for launch. So um, this is a unique unique corridor, but we're going to talk about programs that happen in all of the centers. Today, I just wanted to give you a little bit of flavor of where um, where I live and where I call home now. So the NASA Office of STEM Engagement is a mission support organization. 
uh, and it works with all of the mission directorates within Stennis. We uh, look at students' uh, work, we look at NASA's work, and we try to see where we can enhance STEM literacy and provide some inspiration to the next generation by introducing them to what the missions are doing uh, and build a little bit of that science into, um, into activities and opportunities that they can explore uh, that hit and meet their educational goals uh, and, in, and their uh, personal exploratory goals. So we, our mission is to engage students in science, in NASA's mission across the board. The STEM engagement program elements are divided into four areas for the, the STEM engagement program. Uh, Space Grant, EPSCoR, MUROP, and NextGen STEM. You can find information about all of these on the NASA website, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But where our, our uh, bread and butter it really is, is in educational tools and platforms, providing uh, access to the resources that NASA has to offer, providing access to the opportunities and activities that NASA has developed in each of their um, in each of the mission directorate areas, um, performance measurement and evaluation. We consistently look at how well we are doing. Uh, we set out a learning agenda for the year uh, and for the years to come. And we promote targeted studies to really look at how well we are doing and where the shift in uh, STEM engagement is happening and how to be prepared for that. We look at strategic partnerships. Those partnerships can be with industry partners, they can be with uh, consumer partners, and they can be with um, feder federal or governmental partners, both uh, national and international. And we also have an area of focus on interns and internships and fellowships, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, because those internships and fellowships are both national and international. The benefit being that we can um, provide support to both K-12 uh, elementary and secondary schools uh, for elementary, middle, and high school students. We can provide support to undergraduate students and we can provide support to graduate students, both in opportunity and in resources so that students can further their own research goals. The mission directorates that NASA um, has now uh, have just changed a little bit. Uh, there's always something changing at NASA, uh, but that is for the better uh, because it helps us to really uh, fine tune what it is that we're trying to do, trying to accomplish, and how to best uh, focus our efforts, our financial um, possibilities, uh, as well as where um, space operations and research takes us. So there is a Space Technology Directorate, STMD. There's an Aeronautics Research Directorate, ARMD. HEO, Human Exploration and Observation, has recently been divided into two different uh, mission directorates, the Exploration Systems and Space Operations. Uh, and then there's the Science Mission Directorate. Um, and a lot of the programs that I talk about today are really going to live uh, in the Science Mission Directorate or we're going to draw from all of the mission directorates in terms of their source and their content. We immerse the public in NASA's work, enhancing STEM literacy and inspiring the next generation to explore. We want to create unique opportunities for students and the public. We want to build diverse future STEM workforce by engaging students in authentic learning experiences. And we want to strengthen public understanding by enabling powerful connections to NASA's, NASA's mission and work. And I hope that you'll notice at the bottom of most of the slides, you'll see a um, URL uh, that will take you to where uh, specific information is on the topic of that slide. So I'm trying to, I uh, will try to use the slides to guide you uh, to where you can find further information as well. The first program I'd like to talk about is NASA interns. So my uh, my colleague uh, Jorge Santamayor uh, gave a presentation earlier in the week um, about uh, the International Space Station and other STEM engagement opportunities that are connected between the International Space Station and the different mission directorates. And he provided me with some information about uh, some of the questions that were asked. So I hope as I go through this, if you see some um, duplications, a couple duplications of what uh, Jose, uh, 
uh, Jorge um, provided. I hope that you will see them as uh, a reiteration of things that were uh, very important, uh, that are very important to what we want to convey. But also, uh, I'm trying to answer some of the questions that Jorge uh, was uh, presented with. Uh, so that you don't leave with with a continued question, but you have um, additional questions at the end that we would be happy to answer. So one of our primary um, STEM engagement uh, opportunities is NASA internships, and there is an international component to NASA, NASA internships. NASA international student opportunities um, are designed to prepare students, whether they're national or international students, to work in a global environment and on multicultural international missions. As I uh, identified earlier, every NASA center uh, focuses on uh, some different aspect of what NASA needs uh, in terms of research to really do a thorough job in space and science exploration and research and understanding and to convey that to the public. Uh, and to research in institutions um, and to other scientists, uh, whether they be internal or external, uh, to further uh, additional research. And so um, we always strive to work together um, and we work on multi-center teams uh, and preparing students to be able to do that or to work on multi-country uh, teams or inter-country teams is part of that work. And so uh, the international student opportunities and internships is very important to us. NASA and the nation benefit from the cadre or group of future students, engineers, and professionals who come from all over the globe. And many of the um, questions that we're trying to understand better and issues that we're trying to resolve have a global need for, um, for resolution and have a need for global inter, uh, interaction between all scientists and all learners to be able to fully understand those problems. Internship sessions um, for all students are arranged in three sessions during the calendar year. There's spring, summer, and fall. There's also an International Space University partnership uh, through an agreement with the ISU students enrolled in ISU's Master of Space Studies program or Master of Space Management program can also apply for the international student opportunities uh, for research or for internship at, uh, at some NASA centers and based on availability and a match with the student and their uh, qualifications uh, can be assigned to a center for a period of three to six months to work on um, projects agreed to by NASA. The NASA I-2 program or International Internship Program, are, it is competitive uh, and it provides educational work and experiences for high school, sorry, for undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, that is my mistake. The internship, uh, international internship does not provide for high school students. Um, I'm sorry about that. Interns work always under the guidance of a mentor while directly contributing to the advancement of NASA's missions. What does NASA look for uh, in interns or intern applicants? Um, the projects change each session and each project opportunity looks for something a little bit different. But the skills that NASA routinely needs are listed below. Um, always programming, um, always AutoCAD and fabricating and design. Uh, not only do we look at um, computer science and, and design in a digital age, but we're still bending metal. We're still working with hardware, and those skills are just as important as the um, as the digital design skills. Modeling and simulation, part of the engineering design process, is making uh, making tests and simulations to know whether or not the investment is a good one to make. Uh, so we're always looking to involve our interns into in modeling and simulation situations. 3D printing always important. We have at Stennis actually a company who is looking at um, and practicing printing all sorts of um, replacement products and new new um, hardware features exclusively out of uh, 3D models uh, for flight. And so those, those skills and furthering that technology is very, very important uh, to us and to the future. 
GIS, robotics, technical writing, database administration, and social media management. Um, being able to convey uh, and write about what you're doing uh, and communicate is very, very important. And each of the NASA centers works as a small city. So we have um, all sorts of internship opportunities in every area that you would that you would expect procurement contracting um, but the primary ones for international students are listed we're looking for students uh, who are particularly interested in stem topics that are relevant to nasa's, NASA's mission priorities um, that maintain a high academic standing and have an active interest in the space program and can communicate proficiently in english it's always a learning <laughs> opportunity I think when I first moved from Washington, D.C. down to Louisiana, I felt like I had to learn how to uh, communicate proficiently in uh, Southern English as, as opposed to East Coast English myself. Um, so we always strive to make sure that, that we are meeting the diversity uh, needs of our, our uh, global community, uh, but we can always work together to achieve that a little bit better uh, with every uh, personal interaction and every professional interaction. The current companies, countries, sorry, that have agreements with uh, NASA for uh, international internships are on the screen. Um, not every country has an agreement with NASA to support students uh, with, inter with internships. And at this point in time, because of COVID, the in international internship program is on hold. We don't have any international interns currently. We're looking toward a summer or fall restart of the program, which means that this is a um, is a key point in time for an individual or for a mentor or an organization to contact their space agency, their local country space agency, to inquire about the program and where they are with their agreement cycle and what they are doing uh, with their agreement with NASA. On the next slide, there is also uh, information about the points of contact in each of those countries. Uh, and all of this is also found on the International Internships for Students page on NASA's website. And I hope that I've answered some of the questions that were asked earlier this week of um, Jorge Sotomayor, my partner, uh, who had some con questions about international internships. NASA's STEM Engagement Office also um, produces a lot of uh, opportunities and activities for students that are uh, K-12, uh, undergraduate and graduate for teachers and for educators and parents and other organizations to utilize in their own area. The NASA STEM Engagement Office, stem.nasa.gov, uh, is, is one of the primary houses for uh, this information, um, as is the NASA Express uh, newsletter, which comes out um, bi-weekly, I believe, um, and provides all sorts of information. Uh, about upcoming engagements and upcoming opportunities to engage with NASA, NASA researchers, or um, to participate in webinars and talks that are being held in a public forum. The upper left hand of the screen shows the entryway into the NASA STEM engagement website. And you can see that there's information on missions, on galleries for primary resources, um, and downloads as well and places that you can find uh, additional information. NASA's audiences um, for STEM engagement uh, are identified in the lower section of the screen. Uh, and here, because of the pandemic, and uh, with so, so many requests that we received for providing an easier way for educators uh, and parents and institutions to find NASA resources um, that they could use in their hybrid or totally virtual environments when students were sent home uh, to a virtual school setting. Uh, we revamped the NASA STEM website to um, really place activities uh, appropriate to uh, delivery level 
as well as um, as well as uh, educational standards level, the U.S. educational standards, uh, uh, and um, where we know that students can um, achieve uh, success in um, a semi-autonomous environment with those activities. And so you can find a lot of activities based upon a student's grade level nested within these, uh, these sections. And then there is also a banner that um, tells uh, a little bit about the different uh, challenges and opportunities that are available. Uh, and that is, that is a moving banner uh, that will change as different opportunities are opened uh, and as different opportunities close or announce, um, announce winners. Let's talk a little bit about student learning opportunities. And a lot of these, this information is taken from our uh, highlights uh, publication from 2020, which is available on the website as well. And it goes deeper into each of the opportunities. What I'm gonna focus on are opportunities that I know are available uh, to international audiences, but within the Highlights uh, magazine, the Highlights publication, uh, there are other opportunities that uh, or challenges for students that may not be open in terms of a challenge for international teams, but they are certainly um, possibilities for following and for um, instituting or integrating in an international setting uh, within a university or within a within a school setting uh, right along with what the students are doing. So the information uh, about what is happening is published widely, even though uh, for some things that would be presented, uh, they are not accepting international teams for the competition portion. So please keep that in mind. But everything that I'm going to try to show you today uh, is open to international international teams and international participation in an official sense. So we've grouped a number of the student challenges to uh, into what we call Artemis student challenges. There are seven engineering and technical design challenges for collegiate students and some for high school students across the country um, and around the globe. The challenges provide learning opportunities where students are going to be um, asked questions and asked to perform um, against challenges and issues that our astronauts and our um, space science researchers and developers are currently facing um, in their own work. And so uh, the what comes of those particular challenges and the students um, the, the students participating in them is that not only do they get a taste of what it means to be truly an engineer at NASA or a problem solver at NASA, but they're also contributing to the greater um, uh, the greater collection of ideas and information available to the scientists and the developers um, and the problem solvers who were always looking for unique perspectives and unique ways to look at a particular problem. Uh, there are six of the seven um, design challenges presented here. Uh, all of them are explained in the highlights publication as well as on the um, under Artemis student challenges on the NASA STEM website. But I'd like to look particularly at one. The human exploration rover challenge. This is a uh, challenge uh, that has been going on at Marshall Space Flight Center for a number of years. And what students do uh, is it, within a team, they fabricate, design, fabricate, and test, and then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, challenge themselves to build a rover against a particular set of um, problems and issues that navigates uh, two students, that's self-propelled, two students over a course. One of those students must be a female. Uh, and they navigate a half a mile of terrain. They navigate obstacles, they complete tasks, and all of those change every year. The obstacle choice course changes a little bit. Uh, the tasks that need to be completed change a little bit. Uh, and this is directly uh, in response to uh, exactly what designing a rover that's going to be on the moon or that's going to be on Mars 
or that's going to do any other kinds of exploration for NASA has to do. So as we went from looking at the moon to looking at Mars, there were some design changes that had to happen for a rover. There were temperature changes that had to be considered. There were uh, terrain changes and so that had to happen. So the, the student rover challenge changed uh, with what it asked uh, students for in terms of wheel design, tire design, um, temperature design, uh, weight design, all sorts of different things. Uh, and so this particularly is a challenge that I, I believe directly correlates to what students who are going to be engineering students or material science students um, that um, want to pursue something like this for a career uh, get hands-on, really good hands-on uh, experience. Uh, they also are working as a team. They have to communicate. They have to collaborate. They have to uh, figure out together how to problem solve. Um, and they have to defend their design and what it is that they that that they're challenged to do. Uh, in 2020. Uh, uh, the, uh, in 2021, the HERC challenge uh, had to be canceled for, um, for COVID, for the pandemic. Uh, the challenge occurs uh, in uh, April, and we have not made a decision yet about how we're going to uh, do that. Um, but when it had to be canceled for the pandemic, we then uh, had to turn around and figure out what the challenge would be for students and how they were going to, to deliver that by video and show us what it was that they had created uh, and how, how theirs was the best creation. So um, in 2019, 2019 and 2020, we had over 580 student participants uh, comprising uh, 109 teams. And you can see that um, 82 of those teams were US teams and 27 of them were international teams with 11 countries represented. And so we're really proud of the Human Exploration Rover Challenge or HERC as we call it, uh, in that it does provide a glo global opportunity for students uh, to meet, to design together, uh, to challenge each other and to communicate about what they're doing. You can see a little bit more about the breakdown of the information for HERC uh, for the last year in person and a little bit about um, a little uh, a little bit about how the students enjoyed it because you can see from the smiles on the students as well as on the volunteers uh, that it's a really fun um, event, a really fun weekend, and those are smiles after a lot of uh, trial and error. And you can best believe the Human Exploration Rover Challenge challenges design, it challenges the idea of human powered. Uh, mo um, movement, um, and it is open to high school and college teams around the world. While the international team proposals for this year closed in September, this really is the opportune time to be thinking about, is this something that would spark interest in a community college or a university uh, near you? Uh, is this something that a robotics team that you have uh, would be very interested in challenging themselves for? because now is the time to begin to th think about it, uh, how you would tackle it, how you would, how that funding would happen for you, uh, and then begin to watch as the proposals come in and as the challenge takes place. Um, and you can go back to YouTube and watch videos of prior challenges as well. So um, definitely this is the time to be thinking about this or any of the other international challenges that you might be interested in. STEM on station uh, and education downlinks. I know that Jorge uh, Sotomayor uh, presented some information on STEM on station down education downlinks, but as I said, you know some things are just too good not to uh, not to echo. Uh, the STEM on station program allows students and educators to engage with International Space Station. The uh, an astronaut gives a live talk uh, to students, and the students are able to ask ask questions uh, of that astronaut while on the space station. Um, downlink events usually take place in a large auditorium setting. Uh, we've done them uh, in a face-to-face -face and virtual setting where we've had over 500 students 
together and we collected questions in advance, of course, for that. Um, but they can be done on a smaller scale or a larger scale, but there is nothing better than seeing uh, a student light up because their question uh, is being answered um, and they never thought that they could talk to an astronaut. The other uh, part about the STEM on station and ed education downlinks is that they are all uh, stored on YouTube. So as an educator is talking with students, working with students about what does it mean to live on the International Space Station or what is it like to be an astronaut? Uh, these, these sessions, these one-on-one -on -one sessions um, are not the only way that students can, um, can learn and can benefit from uh, the downlink opportunity. The fact that each of these uh, downlinks is stored on YouTube and you can go back to it allows educators to plan in advance how they want to structure a lesson, what they want to talk about, uh, and then let their play it and let their students see those questions asked. They'll see that the questions they have are questions that other students have had uh, across the country um, at different times. And in that, they see their connection to other students. They don't think that their question is alone. And um, no question is a stupid question. No question is too, too crazy or outlandish. Um, it's funny to talk to uh, astronauts about which questions they get the most or which questions they like the best. Um, <laughs> those are some very interesting interviews uh, and, and uh, debriefs that we have with the astronauts. Um, but from a student's perspective, they see that they are like and have the same interests as other students. Uh, and they can see astronauts and other, other students and other inquiring minds just like them. Uh, and it, it does create a strong community of thought. Uh, and then it allows that, that educator to take it to back to the classroom uh, and talk about that, that aspect as well. Demonstrations. Uh, Jorge also talked about uh, demonstrations, and demonstrations are short videos from the space station that demonstrate and teach scientific principles from space. These demonstrations are um, really, really important to students to um, really see the, the connection of science uh, and the the theories that they learn and the words on a page come to life. Uh, from a um, from an astronaut or from a, a scientist who can explain and then show how something works, uh, what a law or a theory really means. And um, these demonstrations are uh, applicable from early elementary uh, all the way into high school, uh, also stored on uh, nasa.gov demonstrations. And some of them um, have actually been captioned into other languages as well. We have a large Spanish speaking population in the United States and we've had requests for that. And so we do have um, demonstrations that are, are captioned into other languages. So I would take a look at those. Other student learning opportunities um, happen away from the International Space Station and they come out of the creative brains of our scientists, our researchers, and our educators. And one of them is a just recently published graphic novel called First Woman. Uh, it is so new that I don't even have my hands on a copy of it yet, but I'm getting there. Um, and First Woman is a story of Commander Callie Rodriguez and her trip into space. The first issue is about how dreams come to reality, and it follows her path uh, as the first woman on the moon. Uh, what is especially exciting about this particular graphic novel is that um, the first issue follows Callie from her earliest dreams to uh, going to the moon. It is a fully has a fully interactive website uh, attached to it. Uh, the Science Technology Mission Director at STMD developed this, and in developing it, the story, they had so many other ideas about what they could do with a graphic novel that they also created an entire website to go along with it. So the, um, the graphic novel itself is downloadable 
and you can uh, read it online or download a PDF of it. Uh, it hasn't even had its real first printing yet. Um, it is available as an audio. Uh, as I've shown below, it's available as an, as an audio graphic novel uh, so that a student who cannot read it read yet or who is an English language learner uh, can follow along with the audio as the, the graphic novel pages progress. Uh, a teacher can use it in their class classroom with students. Um, a lot of students and a few printed were saving trees. Um, but in addition to the novel itself, uh, it has on the website, it has different interactive pieces that go into a lot of the science behind some of the things that Callie has to do, her training uh, to be an astronaut, what the moon is like, um, all sorts of things. And so all of those elements are available on the um, First Woman website. And this is the first of what we hope is going to be a multi-issue um, endeavor for uh, science, uh, science and Technology Mission Directorate uh, and for NASA to reach out in different ways to students uh, and meet them in the places where they are and where their interest lies. Uh, there is also a Spanish language version of First Woman that will be coming out hopefully in December, maybe not till January. Uh, and we're looking particularly forward to that as well. Another uh, set of educators uh, in our STEM learning office um, has created uh, a set of um, uh, a set of characters uh, that are uh, also in a comic book or graphic uh, graphic um, presentation, and they are the Astro Not Yet's. Uh, and the Astro Not Yet's is is a classroom. Uh, it's a classroom with Mr. Armstrong, and he's explaining different um, different technologies or different. Uh, concepts of science to his class uh, in giving examples and using uh, NASA resources, NASA uh, primary resources to support and show um, exactly what he's trying to explain. And so unlike First Woman, which is a graphic comic book setting, this is a um, this is more of a uh, graphic book read, um, but just as powerful, just as entertaining for students and um, also available online in the uh, NASA STEM area. So when talking about how we engage students, um, there are individual um, aspects that, uh, and opportunities that you can take with you. There are uh, singular activities that you can find and download and um, produce uh, some educational uh, event from, uh, but we also have activities that uh, are designed to do just that uh, in whole. Uh, one of them is the NASA AstroCamp. NASA AstroCamp has been uh, around at Stennis for 30 years, um, but in the last five years, it has moved from being a one location camp uh, to being a collaborative partner that allows communities and organizations to bring NASA content and NASA activities to their own communities by being a bridge between the content and the partner in the community. So instead of offering the camps uh, and running the camps themselves, uh, the NASA Astro Camp Community Partner Program uh, provides an opportunity for partners to um, to uh, sign up, uh, receive training, and receive access to uh, activities that are wrapped around the uh, NASA missions and NASA science uh, areas of research. Um, in 2020, NASA Astro Camp served um, many, many students, than, more students than ever, uh, ever before. The statistics that you see on the right our 2020 statistics, um, and there were 93 AstroCamp sites, ACCP sites. Um, within that, um, and with uh, the uh, COVID pandemic shutting down almost every face-to-face, -face, if not every face-to-face -face camp opportunity, summer opportunity uh, that there was, uh, the ACCP program partnered with some uh, 
corporate partners and some university partners uh, to and put our heads together to figure out how we can uh, not let students fall behind. How can we preserve what it is that we've been doing uh, and give them an outlet and a enhancement to their, uh, their summer and their school activities uh, and keep them engaged uh, in a hands-on format. So within that came um, an idea of AstroCamp Virtual uh, and in some places, Astro Camp to go. So our partners really looked at what they could provide to their rural students and their local community students. Uh, the museums and the schools and the libraries provided these hands-on uh, uh, ideas and these hands-on activities in exploration and discovery. And uh, some of the larger partnerships uh, in some of the most rural areas actually provided the materials as well. Uh, to their uh, campers. So in 2020, there were 93 sites and there were 6,934 students that attended four or five day uh, Astro camps. Um, and of those, three of those were international camps. Um, in 2021, with the numbers just in, there were 140 Astro camp sites with four international partners. And I really don't remember how many participants, um, but I'm, I'm almost positive that that number, that 6,900 number was uh, doubled. So the Astro Camp program uh, in partnering uh, works with Boys and Girls Clubs, it works with other uh, nonprofit organizations, it works with museums, libraries, uh, universities, colleges uh, to, provide these organizations with access to quality content and training for their facilitators. And so you can see an example of our Boys and Girls Club of Greater Houston and how they advertised their Astro Camp for their community. You see one of the team members uh, in, a, in a snapshot from training uh, talking about how to build a stomp rocket uh, out of uh, normal hardware store materials, that is PVC pipe. Um, and this is during the pandemic. So this particular educator kind of, uh, since we weren't allowed in the, um, in the offices, built a uh, kind of a studio in his garage so that we could continue our work um, and continue to train. And then you can see what, the, uh, what is provided to the educators and the facilitators. And this is informal educators as well as formal educators. And they're given or provided um, a myriad of lessons to choose from. This happens to be the Stomp Rocket activity uh, where there is uh, uh, guidance for the educator because we know that a science educator is not a science educator is not a science educator. Um, someone who is you know, on, on the ball in biology may not know much about physics <laughs> when it comes down to it. And many of our um, informal educators are just that, their parents and their docents um, and their volunteers. So we've, we've taken NASA activities uh, and we've broken it down so that um, it is easy to instruct. They have an introduction, they have keywords, uh, they have discussion and follow-up questions and very simple, straightforward uh, instructions on how to, um, how to instruct in the activity as well as science standards for the US uh, so that educators can know where an activity fits for their students uh, and uh, age, age or grade ranges so they know what that activity is appropriate for. And many of the activities are scalable so that they can be taken down or up in grade range uh, according to the mastery of the student group or um, the needs of the camp organization or the partner organization. The NASA uh, Astro Camp or ACCP program, as I said, had um, international uh, partners this year. Uh, again, this year, we had um, an organization in Spain. We had an organization, a school in U Ukraine who ran uh, camps. Uh, in Sasebo Elementary School in Japan, that's part of the DODIA or Department of Defense school system uh, in Japan, and then the Test Lab Fund Science in Ecuador. Uh, they were all collaborative partners with us this summer. 
And here are some pictures from uh, one of those camps. Uh, the camp in Spain actually use, utilized it uh, along with some other um, some other content that they had. They are a planetary ob planetary observatory location, and so they used it with their park um, uh, their park content and their planetary and observatory nights. And then they were also awarded the Starlight Recognition uh, Award in 2020 uh, for education and dissemination of astronomy, uh, in part in reading uh, the award for that because of what they were doing with their youth services uh, portion as well. And so in, what, in, in their hosting, um, they actually at their camp uh, captured participants from six different countries at their location, uh, which was pretty exciting uh, for the ACCP program. And just a few more pictures to show you uh, what these campers look like and um, what they've done <laughs> in their international camps. So the Office of STEM Engagement works to bring together um, STEM engagement from all the mission directorates, but the science mission directorate has a, an extremely robust educational arm itself and I, and I would be remiss if I did not share that with you as well. Uh, at, on the NASA Science Mission Directorate page, nasa.science.gov, um, they always have the mission countdown clock so you can see exactly what's coming up. I'm waiting for this James Webb telescope launch uh, over here. Uh, science by the numbers, what's going on, how many missions are happening, and then helpful links to other things across the bottom. Uh, if you're looking for something in particular or in a um, in a science strand uh, in particular. And then when you go to the overview section, where can I learn science and what is happening? There is always an up to date banner uh, uh, carousel that will let you know what's happening now in in science and in NASA science. Um, and it, there is also a robust um, description and uh, collection of the Student Science Activation Group or Science Activation Coalition. Uh, it is a network of uh, activities and grantees uh, from inside and outside of NASA who partner together to leverage what they're doing in science uh, to make sure that we are having the best integration of research and science uh, and having the best dissemination of that information. And that is, um, a lot of that information is free and available to you. One of those programs is the GLOBE program, which many of you may be familiar with. The GLOBE program really does have student um, activities uh, student research, citizen science activities uh, that students can participate in. Um, and my favorite is the mosquito habitat mapper, probably because I live on the Gulf Coast and the state bird of every state down here is a mosquito. <laughs> but uh, they can look at clouds and be, be a citizen science uh, researcher who takes pictures of clouds and adds them to the collective. And sometimes those pictures of the clouds are matched with the satellite image of the same place at the same time. So we can see what it looks like from above and below. There's a globe project that talks about land cover uh, and, and also one that talks about trees. And so we can see changes from uh, uh, fires or uh, encroachment of water uh, or drought condition changes. Uh, and what is really happening to our less populated lands. Just a little bit more to show you what is happening within those projects. Uh, the Globe Observer Habitat, they had a photo challenge uh, over the summer, uh, asking students to uh, take a picture of mosquitoes and take a picture of habitats. And you can see that Observations were submitted from 31 countries, with most of the observations coming from Thailand, the United States, and India, um, and included 6,200 6, photographs. Um, there's also uh, some aspects of the GLOBE uh, Mosquito Habitat Program that really look at 
what is happening with mosquitoes? How have they changed and how have they changed society? And a comparison to where we are and what we know about mosquitoes now, back to other other times of um, impacts where mosquitoes have, have, have had health impacts or environmental impacts on us. NASA Eclipse is another science activation project. Uh, and they have a beautiful collection of uh, videography and uh, video resources uh, featuring uh, subject matter experts. Um, they do a, a number of interviews uh, per quarter, and those are all available through the NASA Eclipse site and the AstroCamp program and many other programs actually use those video resources as part of their teaching materials as can any other educator uh, who is looking for a particular project or a topic. And when you're looking for something particular, you can go to NASA Science, Learn Science, and use the keyword search to find activities and to find video clips that will help you on a particular topic. It's not a blind search. So the search engine is here and available to help you. And the last but not least is the uh, science activation space place and just a fun place for kids to come and play uh, science games, space games and learn a little something along the way. Always good for downtime uh, and always good for um, oh waiting <laughs> whenever kids are waiting and waiting impatiently. Um, we pull up space place and it doesn't matter what age you are, you'll find something fun on there. Uh, fun and educational. NASA STEM's uh, website is really, really broad and really, really deep, but there are things um, always pulled to the top that are happening uh, that you can set your sights on, kind of know what's coming up in the next month, um, and use them as conversation starters or topic starters uh, for your classrooms or use them to spark some kind of uh, investigation or idea uh, for the classroom or um, just remind you that you want to be involved in some other way. There's a live Q&A with Pam, uh, Pam Melroy, our deputy administrator, who is also a pilot and was an, also a NASA astronaut coming up on November 8th. And you can find the connection information for that at NASA STEM. We had a, uh, a couple of uh, opportunities to meet with Zayla Avant-Garde, who is the National uh, World National Spelling Bee champion uh, for Scripps Howard this past year. Uh, also, she's the world record holder for basketball dribbling. Um, and so we, NASA challenged her, some NASA leaders, leaders challenged her to a, um, a spelling contest, uh, but she said she wanted to show off her dribbling skills because she's known equally for that. Uh, so that's definitely a um, video to go and watch. Uh, and kids will love it, but I was thoroughly impressed over and over again every time I see that. And then on Sunday, uh, we have the Crew 3 launch uh, at 2.21 a.m. on Sunday, October 31st. And so we'll want to take a, take a look at that as well. The NASA Express, as I explained earlier on, uh, is a newsletter, a digital newsletter that comes out that talks about workshops and internships and grant applications, uh, grant opportunities or collaboration opportunities, um, and it promotes student and educator opportunities. It also provides information on webinars and professional development uh, for educators. So if you want to sign up for the NASA Express emails, uh, you can do that, and they're on the uh, NASA STEM dash express uh, website. And then always in this digital world, you can follow NASA STEM engagement and any of these channels to the side. And if you want any more information about any of the uh, opportunities that I talked about or know a little bit more about the programs, um, the NASA STEM highlights uh, per, uh, Publication is available for 2020, uh, and it'll be out for 2021, I believe at the end of the um, calendar year. So that is my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you very much, Kelly. It has been a fantastic yes. conference. Of course, I am always amazed when I hear you or Jorge or all the people from NASA who have supported Milset in the past uh, couple of years, because when you go to the website to Google something about NASA, you find so much information. And this is excellent to hear because you guide us in which materials, in this case, we are talking about STEAM, uh, our organization is focused to support other organizations to give um, spaces uh, for, for young people to develop STEAM. So this information for us is super important because you can uh, go to the source, like the specific things you need, uh, in this case for teachers, for uh, people who love STEAM, and also for kids, because we can tell them where to look for an, any activity. So I am very, very happy because I, I was like watching all the presentation and I want to check the website and, <laughs> and check everything and make all the projects. So I think a lot of people from the audience are, are feeling the same. They will finish and go directly to the website and check what's going on with NASA. And well, I would like to ask some questions to our uh, Millset World Virtual Summit participants who are in Teams uh, session. Uh, I would like to start with Carol. Carol, you uh, raised a question in the chat, but I would like you to open your mic and ask Kelly your question, please. No. Oh, sorry. I, I, well, I didn't, I didn't ask any question. I was just, you know, saying, oh, it's am I'm amazed, you know, to see all those, uh, that presentation and that uh, so much opportunities for teachers and students. I would, I, would, I would like to be still a young person and do those, those projects. For sure, we will promote you know, all your uh, projects to our members and here in Canada, I will do my best that, to make sure that people you know, know what you're doing and what they can, they can have from, for the classrooms and uh, activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I think uh, um, Carol is Millset Vice President, and she forgets that we have a lot of work after the summit, so you will be doing a lot of projects with us, so don't worry about that. Uh, about um, Guy, you have some questions, Guy. I saw that you did some questions. Uh, yes. Uh, can you confirm us that the 13th human on the surface of the moon with a with our Artemis program will be a woman? Say that one more time. Can I confirm? Uh, can you confirm us that the 13th human on the on the surface of the moon with uh, the Artemis program will be a woman? From everything that I've been told, uh, we are we are looking at the first man and the first woman on the moon for the next landing on the moon. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me check if there is someone else. Someone else from the meeting who wants to ask a question to Kelly? Or I go with the questions from the audience on the social media platforms. I have a lot, so be patient, please. Okay, I will start with, uh, meanwhile, you think about some other questions. Uh, I am going to check some questions with Kelly from the social media. So the first one is, in your opinion, which NASA program has um, given the most to humanity? Wow. <laughs> so I have only worked for NASA for five and a half years. I have I have had a very, very broad career in um, Department of Defense, education, uh, private industry, toy development. I've done a lot of things. Um, my career has been in distance learning uh, across the board. And so I really can't say what program has given the most to humanity. I think that the most impactful programs are the ones that uh, have been able to make a shift and connect with students 
whether they were um, face to face or virtual. And we have a number of those. The internship program provides uh, pro provides you know a, a, an incredible opportunity to work alongside of NASA um, educators, researchers, engineers. But um, I think that for me, the most impactful programs are the ones that allow students to do exactly what the engineers are doing and at the same time continue to collaborate with their peers and their mentors where they are. Um, human uh, uh, HERC, the Rover Challenge Program. Those students are working with a team of their peers and a mentor to solve a challenge, but at the same time, they're connecting with their peers that they haven't met digitally to talk about what's going on, to, um, to run down ideas. Um, and that kind of uh, opportunity to challenge your own thinking, to challenge your communication and collaboration skills, and then also to reach out and connect with students you've never met on technical ideas, uh, and then bring that back to your own team is so important with how we need to work globally in anything that we do, whether it's technical or social or um, politically or medically. I mean, that is the essence of what we need to be doing uh, on a consistent basis with respect uh, and with uh, openness and insight to what everyone has to offer. So I would say that the any program that provides students to be the opportunity to do that is the best program. And it really just depends on where you where you find it and what age group you are. So thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you. The next question is from Melanie Graff. She asks, what is the procedure that NASA uses to invite schools internationally to participate in projects and STEAM programs? in research uh, projects? Uh, so in research projects, uh, there are a number of grant uh, opportunities that go out across, uh, across the calendar year. Um, and you'll have to look under grants to see which ones are open to international students. And there are some. Um, some other programs uh, that are challenge programs or activities are just open because they are designed to convey the product that NASA has uh, to a community and let the community run with it, like AstroCamp is one of those. Um, but from a research perspective, um, I, you would want to look under the grants uh, opportunities to see which ones are available, and they change all the time. The grant opportunities are always there, but what is available to international changes year to year. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. I have a question in the chat room. Uh, uh, Stefan, can you open your mic, please? And yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for the very nice uh, presentation. I have uh, the following question that is bothering me the last couple of months, and I'm really interested uh, to hear the answer, of course, if this is possible to be shared with the public at this moment. But my question is how far we are, or how, how close we are, actually, it's, let's put it this way, how close we are as a humanity to finally reach the, the, the final goal and the dream of conquering and finally landing on another space object rather than, than the moon. And yeah, so this is my question. So let me understand how close are we or how far are we yeah. for landing on another? On another, yeah, cosmic object, let's put it this way, yeah, on another planet or on another, yeah. Uh, so, um, not being a scientist myself, 
if I had that question, which I do now, because you've asked me, um, I would go out to NASA Science and I would look at that. There's a um, there's an individual, Thomas Zerbuchen, uh, who is a lead for NASA Science, and that is one of the questions that he discusses in his blog, and he has a blog posted. Or I would go out to Human Exploration Observation, the HEO part of the website, and look at the timeline for what their launches are. Um, as an educator, I keep my vision and my, my perspective about this close, because I'm used to working with younger people who really can't think past you know, Christmas or their next birthday. <laughs> right? Or graduating college, something like that, right? Um, so I'm always amazed when I talk to scientists and they say, oh, 10 years from now, we're going to be here. And they have this whole timeline in their head. Um, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> but that's where I would send you to look at that because it is it is planned out. There is a there is a launch plan and a, and a definite timeline for that on the NASA Science and the NASA HEO, H-E-O website. For just those things. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Guy, you have a question? Open your mic, please. Uh, um, from France, it's difficult to understand that the con country of NASA, the country who landed 12 men on the surface of the moon 50 years ago, the country who won uh, 400 Nobel Prizes, the country who discovered the Pfizer vaccine is also the country of the Flat Earth Society, the country of the biggest creation museum in the world, the country of climate change lobbying. How can you explain uh, this antagonism? That is something that I can explain. Um, you know, I think that every Every individual has their own um, perspective uh, on what is important, what fits into their thinking, their psyche. Uh, my role as an educator is to be, continue to bring science, to, be, to continue to bring inspiration and the idea of exploration to young minds uh, so that they can, they can learn to explore and think for themselves and question learn how to ask questions of what they see and what they experience and learn how to arrive at their own answers, um, that should feed into more questions. And I think that that is the key to being an educator and to really um, enjoy what each day has to bring uh, and to find a passion that uh, will serve you for your life, you know, for walking your, your life. So, you know, uh, every place has its has its uh, conundrums and questions. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I focus. You. Yeah, I focus on the young. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have come to the end to, of the, this conference. Uh, I only wanted to say, um, Kelly, that indeed uh, NASA is inspiring and it has been inspiring for Milset since we uh, met a couple years ago and we have learned a lot from you. And also we are very happy to um, give these conferences to all Millset members and the people who is watching because it's that word for me, it's what make, summarize this, it's uh, inspiring. So thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you to all the people who are watching us from uh, France, Switzerland, Belgium, Mexico, Chile, Romania, the USA, the UK, Slovakia, Austria, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Argentina, Argentina, Peru, Venezuela, Mexico, and more other countries. And a lot of greetings, of course. I don't have all the time right now to tell you all the nice words that you are receiving in the um, social media. But uh, we thank you for all uh, your support and thank you for closing this fantastic event with your amazing conference. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you having me. Thank you.